Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me today. Thank you for coming. And of course, thank you to the Institute and to Nora Owner herself. And I'm very happy to hear because I think this is an issue that we need to treat with urgency. And why the urgency? When we talk about urgency, people will immediately think about the humanitarian crisis. I think it's urgent to talk about it because the way I understand my job, I am working against the buying and selling of people and their services in Europe today. This is what trafficking is. It's about buying and selling people and their services. So uh, every time I go to one of our member states to meet with the authorities, to meet with the NGOs, I also try and go and meet people at shelters. I very recently met a 19-year-old woman from, one, from a member state who told me her story. And her story was that uh, she was um, approached by a close friend who was already in another member state saying, oh, there's a lot of opportunity here. You can get a job. You may get benefits, and it's great, and you should uh, apply for a job as a waitress, etc. And I have friends who can facilitate your coming to the country, and so on. So she did that. And the minute she entered the country, she was uh, snatched by that friend and, uh, and uh, two other two men. And she was locked in, a, in an apartment for a period of 10 months. In those 10 months, first she was forced to marry a third country national um, and then go and, uh, and then uh, make sure that the guy receives the benefits and the residence permit, et cetera, et cetera. And also, conveniently, she was forced to provide sexual services for the friends of the, of the guy, uh, sometimes 10, 15 guys every day. And this went on for 10 months. She didn't step out of the apartment in those 10 months at all. And she is one of the very lucky cases where a neighbor kind of understood there's something going on and alerted uh, the police. The police did their job. They were very good. So she was identified as a victim of trafficking. She chose to go back to her country, both countries within the EU. And she was again very lucky because there was a shelter that was able to take her there for a period of six months. This doesn't happen very often. Because uh, she comes from quite a, a big member state, they have a regional approach to health uh, service. And uh, she, had no, she had no access to health care services. Forgot to tell you that she had uh, cancer, and she also had a heart disease at the age of 19. Uh, she couldn't go back to her village because her family was under threat uh, by the traffickers because obviously she cooperated with the authorities. Um, I know that that woman is no longer in the shelter. I don't know where she is. I don't know if she's still alive. Um, and what I do know is that there's many forms of exploitation invol involved in that. She was trafficked for the purpose of sham marriage. She was trafficked initially for the purpose of labor exploitation. She ended up being trafficked for sexual exploitation. She was bought and she was sold and her body was used repeatedly. And we know for a fact that there's tens of thousands of people in Europe, predominantly women, uh, but also many men, who are trafficked for different forms of exploitation. And what, we estimate, what many international bodies estimate is that there's hundreds of thousands of people in this situation. So, and to be honest, I don't know if it really matters. It matters for policy, of course, but when I think of people, when I think of that woman, and if somebody tells me, well, you're working so that nobody, uh, uh, this, this, this experience is not repeated again, that's, that's good enough. But the fact that we possibly have hundreds of thousands of people in Europe today is horrifying. So when I was talking to her, of course, and I'll come back to, to this later, uh, I did say, uh, you know, it's great that the police uh, was able to help you and that you're in the shelter. I was trying to do the, the stereotypical thing of trying to, to, to tell her, you know, you have your life ahead of you. And she said to me, you come too late. Um, so, so this is why it's urgent because there's lots of people in this situation. But it's also very urgent because with this humanitarian, with this refugee crisis, I think we can only expect that there's gonna be a lot more vulnerable people to be exposed to these networks of traffickers and become uh, victims of different forms. 
And it is also very sad that people are being trafficked into as well as within the EU. So I don't want to conflate my visit here with the situation, uh, the, the migratory crisis that we're faced with, even though they are very linked, and I'll come to that, but it's more than that in a sense. I am talking about EU citizens being trafficked by other EU citizens and exploited by other EU citizens as well. They're exploited sexually to supply unpaid or very low paid work or services without receiving any rewards. They are forced to beg in the streets, forced to commit various forms of crime. Sometimes they are bought and sold for their own organs. And I've met a, a person in a shelter who was forced to uh, sell his, to sell, no, to give his a kidney. And then he had no aftercare at all, of course. And he had a one a year old child uh, and a wife, and they were made homeless. He had no access to antibiotics, for example. And this, is, and this is why it is urgent, in my opinion. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about what we do first. First of all, we are faced with a severe and extremely profitable form of crime, a severe uh, threat to security, a transnational phenomenon, often, not always, and that has implications that individual countries cannot really address uh, uh, on their own. But in my opinion, we are mostly in, faced with a violation of human rights that is expressively prohibited in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. In fact, as far as I understand, it's the only form of organized crime that is explicitly referred to in the Charter. In a sense, it's unique in that way. Often I go to rooms and I talk about organized criminality, and then there's other rooms where I talk about uh, human rights violations uh, against these people, and rarely do these worlds meet. Increasingly they do now, and that's good, and these worlds should meet, because it is both things happening at the same time. Um, and of course, it's not new to say, I think everybody knows that we need a comprehensive approach to deal with this at the local, at the national, at the EU level, at the international level. And I don't want to speak like a Eurocrat, but I think, I think there's people representing non-governmental bodies here, and I hope they will agree with me that the legal framework at the EU level uh, relating to trafficking and the policy framework are actually very ambitious, very innovative. Some people say it's the best legal framework we have in the world at the moment. And why is that? Because it doesn't only concentrate on the prosecution of the crime and the criminals, but also on the protection of the victims and on preventing the crime from happening in the first place. It puts uh, human rights at the center, it puts victims at the center, it's gender specific and it's child sensitive. And really it's not poetry, it is what this directive does, is this legislation does, and the European Parliament agrees with that, international organizations agree with that, and the civil society. And it is, let's, let us not forget, something that the member states have put together. So we have instruments, we have this the strong uh, legislation, and we have a strong policy framework. I think it was mentioned before, uh, the EU strategy towards the eradication of trafficking that actually ends at the end of this year. It was a five-year program that I was responsible uh, to monitor. Um, but we also have this trafficking addressed in various policy uh, documents of the Commission, just recent ones. We have the European Agenda on Migration, for obvious reasons that should be there. The European Agenda on Security, obviously uh, addressed there. Uh, the action plan against uh, migrant smuggling, um, the action plan on human rights and democracy, uh, the new framework on the EU activities on gender equality and women's empowerment in external relations. I, I can go on, but this is just to say that there's different, that is such a, uh, a complex phenomenon that we need to address it in a complex way and from different, uh, using different policy uh, frameworks. So the directive is quite new, is quite young in a sense. It, let's not forget that it sets minimum standards that we must uh, uphold. Uh, the deadline for the transposition, for the translation of the, of the law into national law was already in April 2013. 26 out of 27 member states bound by the directive, Denmark is not bound, have notified the Commission of uh, full transposition, and now we are studying what the member states have notified. We will issue a report at the end of the year. Germany is the only country that has a notified transposition of the legislation. But of course, it's very easy to talk about transposition, and we have excellent lawyers and a lot of goodwill, and I'm sure that, that eventually everything will be in place. 
But the point is to make full and correct implementation of the directive. And this is where uh, the real challenge uh, will come, and the real challenge in also in terms of, uh, of monitoring. Um, in terms of the legal, uh, the, the policy framework, as I said, we have the strategy, we have a lot of concrete actions that, uh, that uh, join many commission services together, varying from um, areas of employment to development cooperation to humanitarian assistance, of course, to justice, home affairs, and so on. Our member states are engaged in this. Civil society is also engaged. And the priorities uh, vary from identifying, protecting, and assisting victims, preventing the crime, uh, the phenomenon, prosecuting traffickers, uh, enhanced coordination, and policy coherence. So I'm not here to list all the things we have done. We have a website, actually one of the only thematic websites in the commission. So precisely we understand that trafficking is not something to be dealt with from a home affairs point of view alone, but it's something that is very horizontal in the services. So we have a thematic uh, website where you can find information on everything that we have been doing. Um, and we also, what I, I like to say is that it's increasingly extremely important that we marry this policy framework uh, with our funding priorities. Because sometimes, and it's a challenge to do at the member state level, it's a challenge to do at the EU level, of course. Um, especially when so many services fund projects and programs on trafficking. So uh, uh, when, uh, when we started putting together this, the current strategy, I was thinking, well, if there's so many services engaged in funding projects uh, on human trafficking, how, how do, what do we know? What, what, what have we achieved? Where are we at? So what we are doing at the moment uh, is a comprehensive policy review. So we have managed to collect every single project funded by the European Commission since 2003 from 11 different services of the Commission. Everything is on the website in terms of projects. And now uh, we have a, a huge study trying to assess. So how was this money allocated in terms of uh, geographical areas, in terms of fields, actors engaged, types of pro uh, projects, and so on? And the most important thing is, what do they say? How do we move on? So. At the end of the year, uh, I'll, I'll speak about this a little bit later, we will have a new policy framework, a, a, a post-2016 agen agenda on trafficking. And I think this policy review will really help us uh, make sure that not only we prioritize correctly, but that we ensure that taxpayers' money are not uh, used to duplicate and triplicate activities sometimes. They, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm working on this, and I'm working on this. And when you think about it, um, from a taxpayer's point of view, you have a project, some, maybe Ireland, uh, if, I don't know, uh, gives development funding in X country, and then an international organization gives money to that X country, and then the European Commission gives money to that X country, and the European Commission gives money to an NGO working on that X country. So unless we know how this money is used and allocated properly, and I'm not saying we're going to get to the you know, we're going to understand everything and get a crystal clear picture. But unless we understand at least where we are, uh, we cannot really be um, in a place to start a new policy framework. And that's why we're trying to finish this, this study at the moment. We also just published a, um, some analysis that we've done on the gender dimension of trafficking. It's a very, uh, obviously trafficking is a highly gendered phenomenon. I'll, I'll say a little bit about statistics later. But the directive itself talks about the obligation of the member states to take a gender-specific approach. And here I want to say something. Let us, before we say, oh, gender sexual exploitation, let's think, gender is both men and women, obviously, and women are highly concentrated when, when it comes to trafficking for sexual exploitation, but then also when it comes to trafficking for the purpose of sham marriages. I gave you an example before. Also when it comes to domestic servitude. Then we have a lot of men who are trafficked for the purpose of labor exploitation. Do we have shelters for them? Do we have provisions on how best to identify them, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Well, the European Commission is clear that trafficking in women and girls is a structural form of, of violence. Um, I won't, I won't go more into that, but I want to focus on what I came here to talk about, which is the issue of buying and selling people. So I think we have become very, very good um, as member states, as the Commission, as NGOs, uh, at repeating that poverty, lack of democratic culture, is a very long list, gender inequality, violence against women, conflict, lack of opportunities, I'm sure I'm missing many, 
is what causes trafficking. And it's convenient, and I had, I had an MEP, a member of the European Parliament, um, three or four years ago, I was saying we have to eradicate trafficking. And she said to me, first, you have to eradicate poverty. And in the beginning, I was thinking, oh, God, she's right. And then I thought, actually, that's very convenient. Huh? Isn't that very convenient? So we, let's just concentrate on, only on poverty. And I think it's, it's, in a sense, let's divert a little bit from that and take a more immediate approach to what is organized crime and a human rights violation. Um, of course, all, all the factors I've listed are pull factors that make people a lot more vulnerable to becoming trafficked. So I'm not gonna come here and tell you, yes, we're all vulnerable in this room to becoming trafficked. This is clear. But not all poor people in the world are trafficked, thank God. And not all people who don't live in democratic cultures are trafficked, et cetera, et cetera. So, while we address all these global issues, we must understand that trafficking happens because it is incredibly profitable. We are talking about a serious form of organized crime. I joined the commission from a very human rights background, and I've become the most converted person that unless we understand the huge profits stemming from this horrifying form of crime, we won't get anywhere. It is extremely profitable. And also, there's demand for the people and their services, often very cheap, that they provide. So trafficking doesn't happen because there are victims or because I don't live in a democratic culture and so on. Actually, if you look at the, the maps of the routes of traffickers, where the victims originate from and where they end up, uh, where they end up you'll find that often they end up in prosperous countries and they're exploited by more prosperous people who become more prosperous if they profit from the exploitation. So let us not put more responsibility on that poor girl who was looking for employment and saying it's her poverty that did that. No, it was the guy who forced her to marry her that did that, and it was the client that did that, and it was those who profited from the situation that did that. So if we want to talk profits, uh, there's different estimates, but uh, in Europe alone, it is understood that uh, only for sexual exploitation, the profits are over 3 billion euro uh, uh, annually. We all think that this is very conservative. The International Labour Organization talks more broadly about uh, forced labor, uh, estimates 150 billion uh, dollars annually for the traffickers, for the, for, for the exploiters. So, Trafficking brings money for the traffickers. 150 billion, I don't know. In the European area, they say about 50 billion. But then there's money for illegal sectors. And then there's money for legal sectors engaged in illegal business. That girl, that young woman I met, was on a bus from one country to the other. The guy had a driving license and a bus service, and it was all nice and legal. And I'm sure he was perfectly aware who he was carrying and where, and she wasn't alone. That, for me, is money in legal sectors engaged in illegal business. And then there's money for legal sectors engaged in legal business. Whether we want to tr talk about uh, uh, labor exploitation, whether we want to talk about sexual exploitation, about a hotel and people coming in and out, there's so many different examples. And of course, we can discuss the, the criminal aspect of that. But what I don't understand, and I spent five years working on this, and I still don't understand, is who profits from the exploitation of others? And I don't understand because they're not exposed. Because we don't have a lot of prosecutions based on that. So who made money out of the exploitation, the buying and selling of others? Who saves from the exploitation? You know how? much you can save from keeping a slave at home. I don't know how much your cleaning costs or baby care and so on, but you can save money. Who benefits from cheap products and services with eyes wide shut? And what are we doing to ensure that we sufficiently target the criminals, the users, the profit makers, the exploiters? For me, if we are going to address trafficking seriously, we have to follow the money. And we must look into the huge financial interest that triggers such a crime. Huge financial interest. I don't know how many times I can say that. It's billions. 
is billions in profits. And we must attack those profits. And one of the many tools we have available, of course, is proactive financial investigations. That they should play a very key role in uh, alternative and as an, as an effective tool to gathering evidence in trafficking cases. So that's one side of it, the money side of it. And the other side that is very linked is also the demand that fosters all forms of exploitation. So in the same way, I, I, can, ask the same, I can ask the question, who buys the services of victims of trafficking? Who buys boys and girls? Who buys weirdly cheap products? Who keeps slaves in their house? Again, we don't know, because again, these people are not prosecuted. And how do the profits that I talked about before, if I'm thinking of the microeconomic model, further fuel the demand, create the demand? The supply, there is the demand, all this uh, continuum, endless continuum of exploitation. So who, who pro how do these profits um, fuel the, this use of, of the services of the victims? And I think this, these are the main questions we need to ask to address the phenomenon in an effective way. And this is not just what I think because one day I, I decided, but the EU law has decided for us. In fact, Article 18 of the legislation says that member states have a legal obligation to discourage and reduce the demand for all forms of exploitation and to raise awareness. This is a legal obligation. Some member states will say, I have posters on toilet doors. I don't know. Is that addressing the demand for all forms of exploitation. It obliges member states to take appropriate action to inform around the issue, but also to reduce the risk of people becoming victims. And the directive has another very uh, tricky uh, paragraph that talks about member states at the very least consider making it a crime to use the services of victims of trafficking when we know that the person is uh, a victim. Let me come back to this buying and selling thing that I, I keep repeating. In some member states today, it's not illegal to buy and use the services of victims of trafficking, even when you know that the victim, that the person is a victim. So we can buy goods that we know have been produced by victims of trafficking, but we would not necessarily be uh, punished for it. We can buy sexual services from people that have been trafficked and we know uh, but we would not be punished for engaging in a crime. Because the last time we checked, human trafficking is a crime. It's in the treaty. It's a famous Euro crime, one of eight, I think. So there is, this is where the important question of individuals, clients, consumers, responsibilities, but also the responsibilities of businesses come in. Because to repeat what the young woman said to me, for the victim is too late. For the other 14-year-old that I met who has a two-year-old daughter as a result of uh, multiple rapes, and, uh, and I met both the little girls, the 14-year-old and the two-year-old, she said to me, I said to her, what do you want to do with your life? And she said to me, what life? I'm dead. So this is what she said. So of course it's incredibly important to have services for these people, and maybe she stands a chance. But a Nigerian woman I met, a lot older, uh, in some other member states, said to me, when I asked her, so what do you want to do? She said, I've been raped so many times. You're a woman. You should know there is no place for me anymore. There's nowhere to go. So I'm not saying that because we shouldn't concentrate on victims. We should focus on victims. This is clear. But not without thinking about preventing the phenomenon at the same uh, time. So... The question that I ask uh, a lot of prosecutors, and sometimes people sneer, but really, it's a, it's a real question. Do we have another area of crime where those who knowingly participate in the crime, in the exploitation, are not criminalized? You know, I like designer bags, I guess. So you go down the street and you can get one for 10 euro, but you have to kind of look around a little bit because if someone watching, you know, you know you're doing something wrong. But if you're buying a person, you're not criminalized. So, and then if we don't criminalize the offense, the crime, what's the alternative? Impunity for the crime? Because we can say, oh, it's very difficult to criminalize. Yeah, I mean, it's very criminal and difficult to find the murderer and so on, so let's just drop it, you know? 
Is that what we do? Is this how we work uh, in the justice system? So we must not forget at any point that the law has many functions and its normative effect is not to be dismissed. So th these are very important issues that we're considering and I keep repeating this because at the end of this year, we will produce a report assessing the legal measures that some member states, because not all of them have chosen to do this, have taken to criminalize the use of services of victims of trafficking, and then, of course, if necessary, come up with proposals. What is interesting is that we have another uh, piece of EU law, the Employer Sanctions Directive. Uh, it's from 2009, and what that law does is to provide for criminal sanctions for the employer's of illegally staying third country nationals who use work of services extracted from the persons when they know they're victims. Very long sentence to say that if employers are using, knowingly using victims of trafficking who are third country nationals, they're criminalized. But if they are EU nationals, not necessarily criminalized. And not, all, not, for, not for all forms of exploitation. So it's time to consider how we consolidate the legal framework. Um, what we do know, as I said before, for the period of 2010 to 2012, the registered victims, some people will say is the tip of the iceberg, others will say it represents some kind of a reality, but certainly they're not all the victims. 30,146 women, men, girls, and boys registered as victims of trafficking in the EU member states. This is what was provided by the member states. So it's not a lot of estimates and sensationalism. It's 30,146 people in the situation of that girl I described before. And this, the number is really a lot higher. We know that. 80% of the victims are female in this, in this statistics, and 70% of the traffickers are male. 16% were children, girls and boys. Um, the most widespread form consistently sexual exploitation with uh, 69%. And the vast, vast majority of those are uh, women uh, and girls. Um, another thing that I think might be interesting in terms of numbers is that 65% of the victims, this is consistent with Europol's report of two months ago, are 65% of the victims are EU nationals. I think that's fundamental because it's important not to take things out of context sometimes. We're here to talk about a form of organized crime that is a huge and severe violation of human rights. That happens to EU citizens and non-EU citizens. But in the EU, the exploiters are predominantly EU citizens. And there are many challenges, of course, in the data collection and in the registration of victims. The top five countries from within the EU are Bulgaria, Romania, the Netherlands, uh, Hungary, and Poland where victims come from in the, in the EU. From outside the EU, we had Nigeria, Turkey, the Ukraine, Vietnam, and others. I do understand, we all understand that we read the data with a lot of caution. It is the best, is the most comprehensive regional set of statistics we have available. Is it good enough? No. Does it need to improve? Certainly. But it's a good uh, exercise that we embarked on. The second one was much better than the first, and now we're about to start the third collection of exercise, and I think the member states and ourselves are learning a lot from this process. Um, another thing is uh, on, on victims as rights holders. Sometimes we, we, we think that it's politically correct to say that they're trafficked persons. Hello, I'm a trafficked person. That's very nice. And we don't like to call them victims because it strips them of their, their agency. No, it strips them of their rights as victims of trafficking. Victims of trafficking at the EU level have a vast area of rights, as they should. So they are women, men, girls, boys who have agency, who have choices, who make options, like that girl who wanted to go, that young woman who wanted to go to the other country to work, of course. But she was a victim of trafficking, and that we need to remember. Because conveniently, when, we, when you talk about a trafficked person, there's no victim. If there's no victim, there's no perpetrator. If there's no perpetrator, there's nobody to criminalize. We can all go home and talk about poverty. So I think it's quite important to insist on this and to insist on addressing all forms of exploitation. And I have never been to any, any discussion where people say, should we do more on labor exploitation or sexual exploitation? This is on the rise. What is this, an auction house? Are we competing for forms of exploitation or are we trying to help all victims? <clears throat> 
we should be concentrating on all forms of exploitation as this relates to trafficking. And especially to children, who are, of course, the most vulnerable, uh, that is uncontested. We have done a lot of work on children. Again, it's not to, to list here. One of the main actions, of course, to be taken at the national level is proper child protection systems that need to be strong, that need to take care of child victims irrespective of status. Talking of status, a few words on trafficking and smuggling. In some media circles, in most media circles, conflated, confused, used interchangeably. Um, yes, they're all victims of trafficking. Yes, they're all smuggled. They're all this and that. I think it's important to, uh, to clarify and not to use interchangeably, although sometimes very, very linked. They are two very, very distinct phenomena, legally speaking. But they're also, it's, impo it's important to have clarity politically, legally, and operationally. What we, uh, we can all agree on is that both smuggling and trafficking are very, very profitable forms of crime. The criminal networks profit tremendously. But I think it, there are serious implications, predominantly for the victims, but also for states, if, we don't, if we're not clear about the differences. Sometimes trafficked persons are smuggled through borders, and often, or sometimes, they might end up being trafficked. But this is not always the case. This is not the case. And there are many different reasons why this is not the case. The first one, and differentiated factors, if you like, is consent. We can spend a whole workshop discussing consent. But in reality, the difference is that a smuggled person, in legal terms, have consented and paid to be smuggled, even though they may be taking a life-threatening risk. Trafficking victims have either never consented, or if they did, initially the consent was rendered irrelevant by, by the abusive uh, actions, of course, of the traffickers. When it comes to children, there's no discussion here. When we talk about trafficking, people do not have to be uh, to cross a border to be trafficked. You can be trafficked in your own little village, whereas smuggling has a clear uh, transnational phenomenon, crossing a border. And then the state responsibility. When a person is smuggled from one country to another, this is a crime against the state in legal terms. I'm not here. I'm not discussing ideological uh, ideological issues here. I'm telling you that legally, they're two different things. Trafficking is a crime against the individual. Smuggling is a, is a legal movement of people in exchange for payment, but no exploitative end purpose. Although the smuggled person may end up, of course, being exploited. Um, whereas when it comes to trafficking, is a completely different story and uh, clearly. But at the same time, there's very strong links. Think about asylum procedures, for example. Sometimes they can be misused by traffickers with serious consequences for the victims. Sometimes we hear, for example, I don't know if you've read in the press, but certainly Europol's, Europol reports are clear from Frontex, from the International Organization on Migration. We have a lot of Nigerian girls that are trafficked into the EU using the migratory routes. I think all of us in the room would identify those as victims of trafficking. It would take about five minutes. I don't think this is a hidden form of crime, always. So you have this eight, this nine-year-old in the metropolitan city somewhere in Europe. And it's clear, I think, to all of us whether that person is smuggled or trafficked and for what purpose. And I think we need to just start recognizing these things a little bit more. The external dimension of trafficking is, of course, a fundamental element of the work that we do. The EU is a global actor and a major donor of aid, of course, globally. We have funded a lot of projects. I want, um, getting a bit aware of the time, yes. So I, will, I won't say a lot about what we do, but I'm happy to answer questions uh, on, on the external dimension. But we do a lot on that. I just want to say something on conceptual clarity. Conceptual clarity is not just when it comes to smuggling and trafficking, because that's a very easy thing to, uh, to explain in some ways. But also, when it comes to, exam for example, trafficking and modern slavery. Sometimes this is used interchangeably. And I'd like to draw caution. According to international law, slavery and trafficking in human beings are two distinct legal phenomena. 
not all victims of trafficking are necessarily slaves, and the other way around. And the characteristics of slavery do not at all times reflect the experiences of trafficked people. The EU law refers to slavery in the context of the exploitation and stipulates that slavery is one of the elements relating to trafficking. The EU doesn't have competence on, tra on, on slavery. It has on trafficking. I will finish with the fishing industry for a little bit obvious reasons. <laughs> the fishing industry is recognized as a high-risk sector for the purpose of forced labor. We have been working a lot in the Social Dialogue Committee for Fisheries in the EU. Um, I think often, like in many other areas, we are aware, unaware, the business sector is unaware of how uh, their links, uh, unaware of the linkages between uh, trafficking and their work. But they should be aware. Hmm? They should be looking for this a little bit more. The private sector should be a little bit more responsible in their supply chains. And we should think a little bit when we eat our prawns. And we should, if for no other reason, because Article 5 of the legislation for the first time holds legal entities accountable. We are very happy to see that the Irish government established an interdepartmental task force to examine a wide range of issues identified in this case of the treatment of workers on board in the Irish fishing. This is, of course, very good. And an agreed new system for migrant workers looks promising, of course. And the EU is ready to support in, in this context. I skipped parts of my presentation. I just want to finish by, tell you, by telling you that I'm not here to tell you that, oh, the EU uh, has done the best thing in the world, etc. But we do have very good legislation in place. That really doesn't need much in terms of ways forward. And we do have a very good policy framework. And we have provided funding. What we don't see very much is the implementation. It would be very nice for me to have a raison d'etre, you know, to remain there for another 30 years. Oh, we need legislation. We don't really need legislation. We need to implement the commitments that we have set out to do. What we will do now is uh, next week we are publishing a report, the first report, the anti-trafficking coordinator's report on the progress made in relation to trafficking at the EU level. This will hopefully happen next week. Um, and I think this is quite an interesting uh, report in terms of developments and trends. Um, we will issue the report on the transposition of the legislation at the end of the year, this famous report on the criminalization, uh, this policy review. So there's, there's a lot coming ahead, and a new strategy, and a new agenda, a policy framework. And now is the time when everybody rolls their eyes because the, the strategy consciously talks about eradication. And then I say that anything less ambitious is an insult to the victims and is an insult to all of us because we're going to tolerate a little bit. And I just want to close by reminding you that 20 years ago, we used to roll our eyes, and I was in rooms where people rolled their eyes when we talked about rape and domestic violence. How are you going to prove? And come on, and these women, they were asking for it. I think at least in polite conversation, we stopped doing that. And we have legislation that makes sure that we don't do that. And I think given the migratory aspect of the crime and the humanitarian crisis, I'd like to finish with a quote from a colleague from the member states. We've had one of those member state configuration meetings. And, and, and he was saying, you know, states are strong and they can protect themselves. Individuals, and especially those exploited, are weak. And it's our duty as societies to protect them. And I think this is what our focus should be. Thank you very much.